I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, controversy over family planning services flaring up in Imperial County. The new law, uh, the rather new legal battle shaping up between Planned Parenthood and anti-abortion groups. Plus, it's only going to get better. So first and foremost, the San Diego Union Tribune has to be that civic conscience for this community. A new era for UT San Diego, the high-profile sale that may change the way the paper covers San Diego news and what its readers can expect. Also, as we say in the prologue, this is as performed by Lear in Hell. All the world's a stage and sometimes the players are puppets. Watch a pair of actors use them to bring a classic Shakespeare drama to life. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. It was quite a soaker. A late spring storm swept through drought part San Diego, bringing rain to low-lying areas and snow to the mountains. KPBS viewer Anthony Johnson tweeted this video today. As you can see, it was pouring in Tierra Santa. The Laguna Mountain Lodge shared these photos on Facebook. Drivers there were urged to watch out for strong winds, fog, and heavy snow. Meteorologists say by the time the storm passes through, there may be up to five inches of snow on the highest elevations. The rain left behind slick streets and wet freeways. Many drivers found the morning commute to be a challenging one. This is what it looked like on Highway 163 heading into downtown San Diego. Nearly 150 crashes happened this morning. CHP says most of the accidents happened before 10 this morning. That's compared to about 170 wrecks on an average day. While rain is somewhat unusual for San Diego in early May, it unfortunately won't do much about the region's risk of wildfires. Meteorologist Alex Tardy is with the National Weather Service. It buys us a little bit of time, but the next time we go into a long stretch of heat or Santa Ana uh, with low humidity, the fuels will go right back to where they were before the rain. That's because rain moistens grass and brush, but doesn't do much to wet those bigger fuels like logs. Tardy says temperatures, though, should return to near normal next week. We're talking 60s, 70s along the coast, you see, with a mix of uh, mostly clouds in the morning, clearing back later. A mix of sun and clouds expected for the inland valleys with 60s and 70s over the next few days. Rain may linger in the mountains, though, with cooler temperatures there. And a hot weekend expected for the desert, mostly in the 80s and 90s. We have uh, more of just how much rain San Diego saw on our website. We also have photos and video of the storm from our viewers. You can see it at kpbs.org. An emotional debate over abortion rights happening now in Imperial County. Religious groups are fired up over the region's first Planned Parenthood clinic. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg shows us the controversy over family planning services. The new Planned Parenthood clinic sits right next to a Thai restaurant in El Centro. The clinic's waiting room is decorated in pastel colors. All of the signs are in English and Spanish. The clinic has six exam rooms and offers testing for HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. Mai Kent Salazar works as a promotora or health educator for Planned Parenthood. She goes door to door in Imperial County telling people about the services that are available. Salazar says family planning isn't usually discussed around here. Because there's no access. I mean, you have no clinics where people can talk about what they feel or what they think. I mean, it's just taboo, you know. It's there, but no one talks about it. Salazar says people in Imperial County should have the same access to care as any other Californians. I think we in the Valley, we all deserve the right to choose what we want to do with our bodies and with our life. Um, and that involves... Uh, choosing what contraceptives we want to use, uh, choosing uh, if we want to have a baby or if we don't want to have a baby and when do we want to have it. But just outside the clinic, Planned Parenthood opponents have a totally different view. And at this week's meeting of the El Centro City Council, opponents gathered outside and made their voices heard loud and clear. 
religious groups held what they called a baby shower for life. They collected donations of diapers, baby clothes, and set up pro-life displays. Lisa Owens works with a Christian ministry called Woven. She knows some people believe in a woman's right to choose. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God gives life and he takes life, and he's the only one that can and should. Amen to that, says Chris Nunn. He's a minister at El Centro's Christ Community Church. Nunn has urged local lawmakers to keep Planned Parenthood out of the area. He says there's nothing wrong with a new clinic coming to town per se. But Planned Parenthood kind of disguises itself as a clinic and tries to come in under the guise of a clinic in order to perform abortions and prey on our young women. And that's really what we have a problem with. Opponents like none want the city council to nullify a recently approved transfer agreement between the clinic and El Centro Regional Medical Center. Such agreements are standard between clinics and hospitals. They allow clinic patients and their records to be transferred should they suddenly need a higher level of care. None says the agreement is discretionary. And that's what we're saying is that here in a community that is 70% pro-life, is it prudent for our city-owned hospital to, to agree uh, to a transfer agreement that their constituents, by and large, uh, would not agree with? Opponents may not agree with it, but El Centro has no legal right to deny the transfer agreement. That's the opinion of an independent legal review the city recently obtained. El Centro City Manager Ruben Duran says he's familiar with opponents' views. After all, in such a small town, he knows most of them personally. Nonetheless, Duran points out he and other city officials are doing the right thing. Well, actually, let's go back to the Reproductive uh, Protection Act. It says that abortions are allowed in the state, and they are protected right in the state. We're following the law. But not exactly, says Planned Parenthood. For now, the clinic can offer all of its services in El Centro except abortions, and it's only allowed to operate 20 hours a week. That's because while the city has issued an occupancy permit, the city's fire chief has refused to sign off on the clinic's final fire safety clearance. The chief says it should be reclassified as an outpatient surgery center, which would require a pricey fire suppression system. The city says it's seeking guidance from the state on this issue. But Planned Parenthood says it's fed up and is suing the chief and the city. It's asking a judge to compel the chief to issue the final permit. In the meantime, 21-year-old Ariana Gonzalez says Imperial Valley really needs Planned Parenthood. She grew up in El Centro. Gonzalez is expecting her second child. She had her first when she was 16 and still in high school. Gonzalez says it's about time someone taught local teens the facts of life. I think education is the, is the key factor in changing behaviors. If you don't know, um, then what's to stop you from going out and having unprotected sex? That's a big problem in Imperial County, where the teen pregnancy rate is 70% higher than the statewide average. Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. KPBS video journalist Nick McVicker helped produce that story. New changes to body cameras for San Diego police a week after a deadly officer-involved shooting. Police Chief Shelley Zimmerman says officers will now be trained to turn on those cameras before they arrive on scene. The reason why we're taking a revision to our policy is to um, make sure that when there's an enforcement contact that we're able to capture that enforcement contact on video. She says this is in response to a fatal shooting in the Midway District last week. An officer says he shot and killed a man who looked like he was armed with a knife and who refused to follow commands. Detectives say the officer did not activate his body camera during the call. A San Diego lawmaker is pushing new state legislation to expand laws that require all police departments in California report information about uses of force and the circumstances that led to the stop. Surrounded by other mothers from various walks of life, Assemblywoman Shirley Weber made her case for better police transparency and accountability personal, telling the story of her own son being stopped by police about 13 years ago in the gas lamp quarter. My son was stopped in the gas lamp coming from dinner some years ago, about 12 or 13 years ago. He remembers it to this day, where he was stopped by the police for nothing. He was pulled over to the side and he was sat on the curb while they went through every aspect of his car and he and his friend. And he said, and he sat there in humiliation while people walked by who were drunk and loud, who didn't look like him, who were obviously engaged in public drunkenness. 
and nobody ever stopped them. Weber says the issue of racial profiling isn't new, but the evidence is mounting and lawmakers need to take action. She's sponsoring two bills to require police departments include in their reporting the number of deaths and serious uses of force involved in their stops, as well as the race, gender, and age of those apprehended. The local ACLU supports the measures and says this is the only way to change the system. Research shows that departments do not, even those under consent decrees with the Federal Department of Justice, don't voluntarily start to collect or report data. It must be a mandate. The ACLU says the last state report about deaths in custody was 2005, when 4,500 people died in law enforcement custody over a 10-year period, from 1994 to 2003. We're not looking for any more tears. We're not looking for any more vigils. We're not looking for any more of those. We're looking for action. I, 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 we're looking for action. Weber says she supports the use of body cameras for police, but those cameras must be turned on to be used effectively. Immigration officials are saying no to five Mexican nationals who asked for humanitarian parole to enter the U.S. The families rallied at the border yesterday. Humanitarian parole is granted for compelling emergencies, and at least one family says they need it for health reasons. They're promising to try again. Signs of a new era for print journalism in San Diego. This after the latest announcement, UT San Diego will be sold to the L.A. Times parent company, Tribune Publishing. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma spoke with L.A. Times publisher Austin Butner about how this changes the way the paper covers local news and what readers can expect under new ownership. Butner says Tribune Publishing's $85 million purchase of the UT San Diego unite the two strongest newspaper brands in California, the Los Angeles Times and the UT San Diego, to form the California News Group. And he said that means a big improvement for the kind of journalism readers will see at the UT. It's only going to get better. So first and foremost, the San Diego Union Tribune has to be that civic conscience for this community. First and foremost, it has to be where the conversation begins every day about where San Diegans live. Not just their neighborhood, not just their city, but that city's place in the state and nation. Uh, and it's that city's state in the place and nation where I think more collaboration can help better inform readers and customers of the San Diego Union Tribune. But first and foremost, it will be all things San Diego to all people in San Diego. Butner said reporters from the L.A. Times and the UT San Diego might collaborate on stories on topics like California's ongoing drought. UT San Diego is likely to do more investigative pieces and more explanatory stories. The paper's current owner, developer Doug Manchester, came under criticism by some who accused him of using the paper and its editorial page to express his conservative politics. Butner says that era is over. They're a thing of the past. I check my politics at the door. You can expect, and all San Diegans can expect, to see first and foremost news and information that's authentic based on the facts. And opinions that are consistent with the community but inform the community beyond just he said, she said, or we like it, we don't like it. In Los Angeles, for instance, we're doing for the first time report cards on local electeds. Now, as the father of four teenagers, a good report card, not mean good or bad grades, I get all kinds at home. But I mean an informative report card can tell you a lot. Not just do we think this particular individual is doing a good job, but what are their responsibilities? What do we look at to see whether they're doing what they told us they do or not telling us they do? And you share that with your readers, you've advanced the conversation, you've informed the conversation. Butner says Tribune Publishing is experimenting with more digital products that keep both customers happy and newspapers financially strong. We have about 250 stories every day in print. Grocery store, you wander through, you see most of the stuff before checkout, and that's the way the print form factor works. Now at the LA Times, I think the same proportions exist in San Diego. We have more stories on the website, 400 stories. Now, if the average customer spent 30 minutes with a print newspaper and looked at 10 or 20 or 30 stories, the average customer has now gone to those 400 stories, they're spending eight or 10 minutes. So 30 has gone to eight or 10 and they're seeing three, four, five, six stories. So the metaphor might be the grocery store where the window's been painted over, the front door locked, and we've placed three or four or five, six things out on the curb. 
lots of conversation about how you monetize those three, four, five, six things. How do you get paid for those stories read? It misses an equally important point, which is 95% of what we have to offer, the customer never sees. So the next evolution, we believe, is going to be to unbundle those 400 stories around communities of interest. San Diegans love their chargers. We should speak directly to that community about what's happening with the chargers. We can then take that, put it in the real-time archive called the website, put it in the next day archive called the print newspaper, but we've got to get to a point where we can publish information directly to that community of interest. And by I say publish, it could be a video, it could be a podcast, it could be in print, it could be all different forms, it could be an event. Now, Butner isn't your typical newspaper publisher who started from the ground up, from reporter to editor to publisher. He comes from a pretty diverse background. He used to work as an investment banker on Wall Street, and the Clinton White House hired him to help the U.S. government assist Russia change over from communism to capitalism. Butner will be the publisher and chief executive at the UT San Diego as well. Back to you. San Diego researchers say post-traumatic stress disorder affects more than just the mind. KPBS science reporter David Wagner says they've linked PTSD with accelerated aging. UC San Diego psychiatry professor Dilip Jeste and his colleagues reviewed dozens of studies and they found a common theme. Whether they acquired PTSD because of military service or natural disasters, sexual trauma, Patients were more likely to get age-related diseases and even die at a younger age when they had PTSD. Not only that, the protective caps on their chromosomes were wearing down at a faster than normal rate. Jeste says he was surprised to see that in many cases, just one traumatic event could be linked with lifelong physical harm. It's like a domino effect that continues through the rest of their life. And that's not something one would expect. The researchers say these signs of accelerated aging suggest that doctors should treat PTSD as a mental illness, but also as a physical illness. David Wagner, KPBS News. UT San Diego is sold to the company that owns the Los Angeles Times. Why is San Diego Unified building football stadiums with bond money? And a sewage backup this weekend showcases the neglect of Balboa Park. Join us for the roundtable tonight at 8.30 here on KPBS. A bill to provide more oversight of Civic San Diego advanced in Sacramento this week. Amitya Sharma looks into the recent controversy over the agency designed to revitalize urban neighborhoods. Civic San Diego is an offshoot of the Center City Development Corporation. It was created three years ago after the state abolished redevelopment agencies. It was meant to manage projects that were already in the pipeline. Civic San Diego President Reese Jarrett joins me now. Reese, Civic San Diego is a non-profit, a city-owned non-profit. What is its mission? Its mission is primarily to focus on the wind down of redevelopment, managing the assets that were clearly in place at the time redevelopment was dismantled by the state. But more importantly, it is involved in creating economic development opportunities, not only in downtown but in, in other communities. We also focus on the entitlement and permitting for land use in, in the downtown area, which is part of the community plan and general plans that the city of council uh, has approved and has been part of uh, civics past for the last 40 years. Uh, additionally, we manage the parking uh, district downtown, and we are uh, involved in creating a, the lifestyle in downtown and many other communities. What would you say are Civic San Diego's accomplishments? I think some of our greatest accomplishments are the fact that uh, we've been involved in the development of uh, over 7,000 homes uh, in the uh, past, and of those, about 6,000 of them have been affordable uh, in the downtown community, uh, particularly. Earlier today, I spoke with Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, and as you know, she has introduced a bill that would boost oversight of Civic San Diego. Her bill would 
actually give San Diego City Council final authority on Civic San Diego projects. Here's more of what she had to say about what she thinks is the operation and the leadership of Civic San Diego. They're just a board of folks, quite frankly, that the, the mayor decided he wanted on that board. Of course, city council agreed to it, but um, they're, they're accountable to nobody. You know, you can't go to the ballot box and, and express your dismay about them. You can't force them to be transparent and open. Um, they've tried to do a lot of business behind closed doors. They refused to listen to the community, um, went on a listening tour, quite frankly, where they talked to the community rather than listen to them. So I, I think it's time that that civic board continue to do the ministerial acts that they're doing now. But when it comes to discretionary acts and land use and big projects, we have to have the ability to appeal it to the city council, not only because it's good public policy, but because Quite frankly, it's in line with California Constitution. What do you think of her criticism? Well, I think it's unfounded. Uh, we clearly follow the uh, delegated uh, authority that we have as it relates to entitlement and permitting downtown uh, that was delegated to Civic San Diego. The city attorney has opined that that delegation was legal, is legal, and that uh, I think that uh, our outreach in the communities has been very robust. Uh, we have a very uh, significant involvement in community uh, outreach and uh, involvement in land use uh, decisions that take place. And uh, I just think it's uh, unfounded and uh, misrepresented. So outreach is one thing, but how big of a seat do community members have at the decision-making table? They do uh, completely in terms of what goes on in uh, clearly in the downtown area where Civic does have the entitlement and permitting process. Outside of downtown, the process is the same in every other community that uh, interacts with the city. Uh, the ability to get projects approved is a, is a process that uh, is involved with the city and with community outreach with the recognized community planning groups uh, that happens all across the city. Now, Gonzalez's bill comes at a time when Civic San Diego is looking to expand into other neighborhoods. Tell me about that. Well, I believe that it's important that as we move into these neighborhoods that we have a toolbox of opportunities to allow those neighborhoods to grow in terms of economic development, affordable housing, quality jobs. These opportunities uh, take place because there are and public investments that take place that stimulate private investment, the public partner par partnerships. And we think that that's important. Uh, the tools that we have now don't allow us to actually uh, involve ourselves in the planning and permitting process. But we still can go out and create economic development opportunities. Very quickly though, what neighborhoods does Civic San Diego plan to expand into? Well, our major focus is the former, are the former redevelopment areas, and right now our major focus is going to be in the Canto area around the 4th Council District. And we have some assets there. We are currently out for a request for qualifications on a significant site of about 8.5 acres that we're looking to attract mixed use of residential, commercial, and retail uses, and we will use our assets our public assets like that to help to stimulate development in our community. Reese Jarrett, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next News Hour, the next frontier, the promise and the worries of artificial intelligence. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. They can sing, they can joke around, but can they do Shakespeare? The next challenge for puppets on display tonight at the 10th Avenue Theater. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando shows us how two actors use them to bring King Lear to life. If the eyes are the windows to the soul, then these puppets reveal an unexpected depth of emotion that captures your imagination, thanks to the creative duo behind the independent eye. I play King Lear barefaced. And I play the fool. With a uh, nose. Right, with a red <laughs> nose and a Three Stooges uh, clown wig. Yeah, and, and all, of the other, <laughs> all of the other characters are puppets, and you really have to learn instinctively what their expressive mechanism is. Nothing conceals them on stage as they employ 20 puppets of varying kinds to bring Shakespeare's King Lear to life. Normally we use uh, hand puppets in this, but we use a few of these guys who are a little bit different in style. Thou nature art my goddess, 
To thy law my services are bound. The nature of the puppets is something that brings out really the voice of the text more strongly than conventional acting. As we say in the prologue, this is as performed by Lear in Hell. He's it's storytelling really, his own tragedy. It's really his own puppet show. But there's an inherent risk of being stereotyped when using puppets. Anytime you say the word puppet, children is what first comes into mind. Yeah. And we have to say, you know, no one will be legally barred from the space, but we want people to go for one. For one thing, this is a hundred minutes long with no intermission. <laughs> and it's very dark. And the extraordinary thing is that we get extraordinarily strong response from it. I mean, people, oh yeah, I cried. If you want to feel terror, you give yourself with great confidence to Stephen King. And he comes through for you. He scares the living daylights out of you. If you want to feel loss and the wish for redemption, you give yourself to King Lear. And to the capable hands and puppets of Conrad Bishop and Elizabeth Fuller. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. The Independent Eye's King Lear runs tonight through Sunday at the 10th Avenue Theater. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great weekend.